Okay, is this mic working? Yes. Everybody can hear me. Well, this map is great because it'll kind of keep me on track. Maybe this tree of coats, but predating coats were shawls and wraps. And you see a lot of old pictures of women wrapped up, especially wrapped and tied behind their backs. And you see this a lot in the North Atlantic region. A lot of people are familiar with the Shetland shawls because there's a huge lace knitting tradition there. Started up when there was a sock, there were people earned money knitting socks. And then they got it so they could do it with a machine, put these knitters out of work. And that's when the lace shawl tradition started up in the Shetland Islands. <clears throat> and often you see a lot of Shetland shawls now and they're doing um, retreats in the Shetland Islands and some of the knitters are going back to the basic format for the Shetland shawl because they started them with the edging, kind of a sawtooth edging, and then they would knit the border and then they would knit the center. And so a lot of times in modern times, we knit the center, pick up all the stitches around, knit the border, knit the edging. But the traditional one started with the edging and they had a unique way of grafting the corners, the slanted corners from the border to the edging that um, I've never taken a class on and do not know how to do. But there are people starting to write about that tradition. The Shetland shawls were also uh, largely garter stitch shawls, very elastic, and they interspersed patterning on one side with patterning on both sides. And one person I heard describe it <clears throat> said it's like fair isle knitting, the light and the dark through the, and the Shetlanders accomplished that by doing lace on every row, patterning on every row versus patterning on every other row. Um, a woman from New Zealand, Margaret Stove, said knitted lace is when you pattern on every row. Lace knitting is when you pattern on every other row. And an easy way to remember that is knitted lace. There's crocheted lace, um, bobbin lace, and actually lacers don't consider knitted lace even real lace because it's much coarser. But you can do a lot finer lace with bobbin lace and even crocheted lace. So knitted lace would be the finest and then lace knitting would be patterning every other row. So the Shetlanders interspersed that and now there's a variety of Shetland shawls their sheep came in a lot of natural color, different colors, so they used those colors for shading. Um, I think we're all familiar with like the old shale patterning. And um, this shawl here is in Dottie's yarn. I forget the, what the colorway is called, but it's the Irish girls. Okay, it's the Cordova Rainy Day Buttercup. But you can see how um, there's the top part has the garter stitch, and then there's old shale, which is used in many traditions. And then it has just a crocheted cast off. But that would be my most uh, <laughs> typical. <laughs> and I've got a lovely volunteer <laughs> taking it around so you could actually see it. But um, that is not traditional at all because it was knit top down. And it's actually also an example of Icelandic lace because the Icelanders did cast off with the crochet chain. But the Shetlanders, their edgings often were perpendicular to the border, so you could bind off stitches with it. They started with the edging, then did the borders, and then did the center. So that's the Shetlanders. And then moving up, uh, we can talk about the Scandinavian countries. I've only mainly seen the Norwegian, some of older Norwegian shawls, and they often were garter stitch triangles and kind of an inspiration for the Cordova, for the buttercup. So women often just wore simple triangles 
wrapped around and in garter stitch, they'll elongate across the top, even if they're knit from the bottom up. So they would sometimes shape the shawl at the top. The, uh, the other thing that's interesting about some of these older shawls, like the Shetlanders did the edging, not many stitches to start up with, but a lot of the other traditions would start off cast on 500 stitches. And they'd start from the bottom, from the widest part, and then knit to the top. And I don't know why they did that, <laughs> but it means if you ran out of yarn or had to change color, it would happen at the top back neck instead of further down and look more planned. But um, they could do some shaping with short rows to elongate the top edge because often they wore them wrapped around and tied in the back. Sometimes they would knit a lining for the shawl, another shawl that they could attach, or they would fold it over. So I think we've all seen that. Yeah? What kind of needles did they use in those? What kind of needles? Straight needles. Because, and maybe a lot of the double points, long double points, I think, in the Shetlands. They had, they call them knitting pins, but they were long, and they'd use bunches of them for the, many of them. And you've probably seen the, um, the waist thing, the, yeah, the, belt. the knitting belt, yes. And that would often be used to knit lace too. So, and I think in Norway and Sweden and Finland, I mean Sweden and Denmark, those, those are the Scandinavian countries. If you, in Seattle, there's a Nordic Heritage Museum. And I learned quickly when I helped with the Nordic knit, first Nordic knitting conference that you don't say Scandinavia unless you mean just those three countries because Finland and Iceland are not part of Scandinavia. So, um, and now they're calling Iceland the Faroe Islands, which are a little bit west of Iceland, and um, Greenland, the Western Nordics. <laughs> so there's more attention now given to those other kind, uh, countries with global warming issues, and they're starting to look at some of the countries that were less, were more ignored in the past. Um, Greenland obviously does not have much of a knitting tradition. They're not sheep there. But in Iceland, the sheep outnumber the people uh, three to one, and the same in the Faroe Islands. So they have strong knitting traditions, and the Faroe shawls are interesting in that there's a back panel so it's like a triangle, but in the back, there's a shaped panel that usually is narrower at the top, and then it goes down, widens at the bottom. And they start at the bottom, cast on 500 stitches, and then uh, knit a few rows, and then start sometimes a lace border, and then work towards the top. And the panel can give a shape to the top that makes it wearable, it stays on the shoulders. The tricky thing with the pharaohs, though, is that the panel, obviously, for a petite person, maybe somebody five feet tall that weighs 100 pounds, it's going to be narrower than for a larger person. So you have to kind of figure out the proportions for um, the shawls and offer a lot of different proportions if you were going to do a pattern. So I've never been tempted to do the pattern. but. Um, what I probably know more about is the Icelandic shawls, and that is, again, thanks to the Nordic Heritage Museum in Seattle, when I first was asked to teach about uh, Icelandic lace, they had a museum that had a whole room just for Iceland. Uh, it, it was in a former elementary school, so it was like a classroom size. They had a Norway room, a Denmark room, a Sweden room, and a Finland room, and the Iceland room. And in the Iceland room, they probably had more lace than any other museum outside of Iceland. So it was a lucky thing for me because they've now moved the museum, and instead of having a room, they've got like a full-length mirror size panel with some Icelandic stuff behind it. So the lace has gone back into storage but I got to view a lot of it, and 
It's mainly all from patterns. What really helped put the Iceland lace on the map was uh, a book. It's in, it's in Icelandic, but it's called the Three Cornered and Long Shawls book. And there have been English translations for it. But a woman went around the country and surveyed what people were doing with their lace. And because Iceland does not have a large population, about 330,000 now, but at this was at the beginning of the 1900s and the mid-1900s, so there were fewer people, she would find what knitters in all these remote areas were doing. So there wasn't really a trend. It was what this knitter was doing, what that knitter was doing. But there were some commonalities. And one of the, um, they started at the bottom and uh, cast on like 500 stitches. But sometimes they would start above the edging. And then they would later come back and pick up all those stitches and then knit the edging. But their edgings were different than the other lace traditions in that they're like tablecloth or doily edgings. So they're not knit perpendicular to the piece. They're knit in rows with a lot of um, increases, very dramatic increases on the rows. And this one here is the, I'll just mention, this is not real typical because <laughs> it's uh, pretty wide. And so it's a modern interpretation of an Icelandic shawl. It's what we'll be doing in the class here. And it was knit in a Shetland yarn. But it has the basics of that, those wonderful edgings that the Icelanders did. And I think one reason they cast on above the edging is they could do a lot of plain knitting and then come back and use a pattern for the edging. So, uh, yes. The dark purple is the bottom. I started that one at the top and knit it down. But they would have knit started at the brighter pink area and knit towards the top and then come back and get all those stitches and then knit the edging. Yes, she's got it. <laughs> So the, the lace knitting tradition in Iceland is fairly recent. Um, they started doing some lace in the late 1800s, but it's more of a 20th century thing. And um, during the economic boom, they, the knitting went down in value. Um, people were using their income to buy European goods. But I think it's wonderful that after the economic collapse in um, 2008, where, and there's still horrible effects from that in Iceland, um, but, and somebody was talking at dinner tonight about how the bankers went to jail there uh, for the economic collapse, yeah. Um, that after that, the lopi pace of the lopi sweaters became a point of pride. And you started seeing a resurgence of people saying, that's not who we were, who we are are these people with our, with our sweaters. There's still not a big boom over there in um, lace knitting, shawl knitting. And actually I was there in 2009, I think, on a tour and I got to teach in a local yarn shop, and there'd been people who'd knit my shawls, but never one of their own shawls there. <laughs> so it was kind of amazing to kind of reintroduce the tradition. And later I got to met, meet a woman who had collected some of the older shawls. So that was really a treat too. So that gives you an idea of what some was going on. These countries were generally very po poor countries. And um, in Iceland, there were women who did go fishing. There's a woman that f works at the University of Washington who wrote a book, The Sea Women of Iceland. I think Dottie had the book. 
And so if you want to read about that, they weren't knitting when they were fishing, obviously. And um, if they were smart, they were having children because in their old age, they didn't have social security. So it could be a real bane for them if they didn't have children to help out later when they couldn't fish. So any other questions or? Well, thank you very much.